You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. everyone welcome to a word from the lord james over here with you we are trying to get set up here all right it's good to be back been out for a few weeks 10 meeting and uh other uh not, not problems Ten meetings not a problem but problems and tent meetings kept uh, kept us off the air for a while and uh it's good to be back with you hope you're ready for a study from god's word here's our contact information 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me word from the lord at gmail.com and if you're in the area of Eden, 250 the Boulevard is where we assemble on uh, the first day of the week at 9 and 10 a.m. and on Thursday nights at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, on Thursday nights we're studying 2 Thessalonians now. We're getting into 2 Thessalonians, so if you'd like to come and study the Bible with us, we're glad to have you and uh, we'd encourage you to come out and take advantage of any time you can study the Bible with the members of the Church of Christ. They're, the, they're your friends who really want to study the Bible. I think that's evident from uh, the fact that we're always on television, we're always opening up the phone lines and letting people call in and ask us questions. Uh, we're the individuals that are allowing people to come out to the tent and ask questions. We're the individuals that are not charging you, passing the chicken bucket or the paint bucket or anything else around to take your money every time you see us. Um, so I don't understand why more people don't at least come out and examine the Church of Christ. I mean, everybody, everybody that's against us says we're a cult, but we're the only people that are open uh, which is not what a cult does. So I would encourage you, at least if you're in the least bit curious <clears throat> about what uh, our worship is like, what uh, what the people are like, come out and, and uh, assemble with us and study God's Word with us, and I think you'll be surprised what you'll find. Uh, speaking of asking questions, tonight I want to start off with this uh, article that uh, I read uh, uh, not too long ago, and it's about individuals who are not prepared to enter into the working force because they don't have the, uh, the, the, the key concept of critical thinking. They just don't have the ability to critical think, and that is to problem solve or uh, rationalize, you know, what is the problem here, what has caused the problem, what is, what is a solution, what's a viable solution, how to do things without being told they can work out their own problems. And the article says that tests find that college graduates lack skills for white collar jobs. Now friends, that's very important, especially when you're talking about a, a, uh, an economy where more and more people don't have jobs and more and more people have, having to find ways to make a living. Now I know our, our government tries to make it easy for people not to get work. I mean, when you can be on uh, unemployment for 99 weeks, you get a government check for 99 weeks being on unemployment, and not have to look for a job, that is conditioning people not to go to work. And it's no wonder why people don't have the skills to t hold down a job because when they're in college, when they're learning, uh, they're you know, getting their degrees or whatever, they're not being asked to pro solve problems. They're being told, here's a standardized test, answer all the questions, memorize the answers, and then you'll pass or then you'll fail. But this test shows that people aren't thinking. They're not made to think. They're not, they're not made to uh, consider consequences or how to work out problems. Here's what the article says. It says, four in 10 U.S. college students graduate without the complex reasoning skills in white, uh, to manage white collar work according to the result of a test nearly 32,000 of nearly 32,000 students. So 32,000 students, four out of 10, didn't have skills, reasoning skills. Now, friends, that's, that is a basic uh, concept of life, if you will. If you want to get anywhere in life, you need to ask yourself or learn how to ask questions, how to problem solve, you know, what will work here. Let's reason through something. The article goes on to say, on average, students make strides in their ability to reason, but because so many start at a such a deficit, Many still graduate without the ability to read a scatter plot, construct a cohesive argument, or identify a logical fallacy. 
Now, here's what we're talking about, friends. When you are hearing someone talk, most students never uh, reason or never uh, think about whether something has been said is true or false. They're just taking it as on face value as being true. That's why so many people are buying into this garbage like global warming, things like that. Now think about this, friends. You're told, let me get off on a tangent here. <clears throat> you're told, you're, if you came up in public school, you were told, you're taught evolution. Evolution says that the earth is millions and billions and trillions and gillions and however many years old, and they keep changing the number because they need more time. But the earth is all these millions of years old, and then we're told that all of a sudden we're going to destroy the world because of global warming. Now, here is where reasoning takes place. Here's where a little logic takes place. How long, how many years, you should ask your teacher, have we been taking into account uh, weather? How, many, how long have we been keeping track of weather patterns? What's the high temperature, low temperature? I think if you go back, I don't really know the, the answer, but I don't want to say it's not much over 100 years at that. <clears throat> Caleb, do you know, have any idea? But it's, it's not very long in the grand scheme of things. How long have we been taking records of weather patterns? Now think about this. If we've been studying weather patterns for 100 years and all of a sudden now we're going through a cycle where it's getting hotter, well, out of 100 years, yeah, that, that cycle may, may mean something. But if you're talking about one sliver of time, let's say 10-year period of time, out of 100 years, that's a big chunk of time. But 10 years of time out of the millions and billions and trillions of years that an evolutionist told that the, that the Earth's been in existence, friends, that's just a drop in the bucket. So how, why is it worth to believe evolution and then believe something that is uh, uh, logically uh, fallible about global warming? See how silly it is? It's just ridiculous. I mean, back in the 70s, we were told uh, we're going to have a, another ice age coming about. And now... In the 90s and our early 2000s here, we're told, oh, it's global warming. Well, can you get it right? Can you get it right? Can you get it straight? I mean, weathermen can't even predict what's going to happen tomorrow or next month, much less 10, 20, 30 years from now. I mean, Al Gore, former vice president, said that in, in uh, 10 years, the earth is going to be destroyed. Well, you know what? His deadline, he met his deadline this year. You know what? Here we are. We're still, we're still, still here. Ice, iceberg is still there. Right? The polar bears are still living. See how silly it is? But I'm talking about, friends, no one questions things. They just take it at face value. And we're saying, that, and what this article is saying, that people don't know how to ask questions. They don't know how to relate or find what is problem, what's true, what's, what's not. It says, this exam, known as the Collegiate Learning Assessment Plus, measures the intellectual gains made between freshman and senior year. The test doesn't cover subject areas, uh, knowledge. Rather, it uh, assesses things like critical thinking, analytical reasoning, document literacy, writing and communication, essentially mimicking the baseline demands for professionals. In other words, someone want, hires you for a job, they want to know, well, can you, can you problem solve? If something breaks down, can you figure out what the problem is and fix it? Or do you go, well, I don't know how to do this, so let me call somebody. Solve it on your own. Figure it out. Try to work it out. And he says they don't have these skills of critical thinking or reasoning. You know, if this failed, then this must be the problem. See that? So they don't have these skills. These are skills that are important no matter what you are doing. If you're serving on a jury or looking for a good candidate to vote for, these are highly transferable skills. The bottom line is, friends, critical thinking involves one important uh, ingredient, and that is asking questions. Asking questions. Who's the guy I'm going to vote for? What does he believe? What does she believe? What do they stand for? What are their, what are their policies? Who is, uh, our, <clears throat> um, you know, what do you say, uh, looking for a job or you're serving on a jury? If you're serving on a jury, what would you ask? Well, did he do it? Did he have the motive to do it? Was there opportunity to do it? Uh, was he uh, in the area? You know, is the DNA or whatever? All kinds of questions. You know, I would want someone, if I was being on trial, I'd want someone to be asking some questions 
to, to know that I was uh, not guilty. I didn't want them to find me not guilty, so I didn't want them to be questioning. I wouldn't want them to just take what the, uh, uh, the prosecutor said about me. So you know what, I'm, what we're talking about? So you need to ask questions, and questions are a basic tool that so many people don't, don't know how to use. Now, it was said about Socrates. Socrates asked questions which his disciples tried to answer. Jesus provoked his disciples to ask him questions that he would answer. <clears throat> now, which is a better skill in a disciple? Listen, Socrates was interested in trying to trip up his students, the people who didn't know. Jesus wanted his students to learn something. See that? And so that's why it's important to know how to ask a question. It's important to learn and get people to think. I know sometimes when I'm teaching class, I, my wife tells me, she says, you know, you, you ask questions and I don't know how to answer them because our, our line of thinking is totally different. Well, that's, that's something I need to work on. That's something I'm working on, on how to ask questions to get people to think and come up with the answer. But it's part of critical thinking. It's part of being uh, able to say, all right, why did this happen? What's going on that would make this happen? That's critical thinking. Now, questions encourage thinking. See that? That's why when you ask a question, it really ought, it ought to be that you're asking the question while you're examining yourself. Now, look at what one of God's prophets said. God's prophet, hey guy, ask God's people some thought-provoking questions. Look what he said in uh, Haggai 1 and verse 4. He said, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lies waste? You see what that question did? That question was asked by a prophet and it was asked to people who had their houses built. And here the Lord's house was not built. And so he's asking them, isn't it about time for you to do something? I mean, here you are living in your houses. Everything's, they're all sealed up and everything's ready. They're finished. But the Lord's house is not finished. Is it, is it time for you to just stay at home? Or is it time for you to get out and do some work? Now, that ought to cause people to go, you know what? Yeah, uh, I've, got my, I've got my life taken care of, but there's, a lot of, there's something left for the Lord to do. There's some more work of the... Uh, some of the Lord's work I need to do. So he, he's asking them thought-provoking thought -provoking questions. Look at this, Haggai 2 and verse 3. He said, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it, uh, is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? In other words, he's asking people that remembered Solomon's temple. And he says, look, do you remember the first, the first temple? And he's wanting them to think back. Yeah, I remember Solomon's temple. Look how great it was. And he says, and how do you look at it now? Compared to what it is now, you know, it's just going to pale in comparison to the first glory of the temple. He's wanting them to remember and motivate them to do something. That's what questions do. That's what questions do. And so, friends, that's why we look at questions and we open up the phone lines and we say, you know what, ask us questions because if you ask us a question, then we get to get you to thinking. We try to get you to respond, to do some critical thinking and examining about maybe what you've heard or been taught or what you believe. <clears throat> Is it in the Bible? And it's like the caller that called in and talked to uh, uh, Caleb earlier. He asked about, well, the Baptist, you said the Baptist church is not in the Bible. What about the Catholic church? And so Caleb went through a series, and he says, look, what have I been saying? If it's not in the Bible, if, if the Baptist church is not in the Bible, don't be in it. Now, is the Catholic church in the Bible? See, what was that? That was a question that, want, that should have provoked critical thinking. The caller should have said, well, you know what? If the Catholic church is not in the Bible, if the Baptist church is not in the Bible, the Catholic church is not in the Bible, then I should have the same response. Anything that's not in the Bible, any church that you can't find in the Bible, you should not be a part of it. Why? Because it's not from God. God didn't talk about it. Why, you been part, why would he want you to be a part of it? See? It's, 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 probably, it's trying to get people to reason together, and that's what the Bible is all about. Now, if you want to rightly divide...
the word of truth, and that's what Paul said we should do. 2 Peter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved, the workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want to write the Bible word of truth, friends, you need to ask questions. Now, there's a preacher in, in Eden named Connie Earls. Many of you know him. I know some of you folks that are uh, members of Connie Earls Church. And uh, and Connie Earls has said that we're false teachers. You know, that he actually told people don't go down to our tent meeting because because we're false teachers. But here's the thing. Connie Earls uh, was asked about discussing what the Bible taught about miracles. All right? I was told, you know, hey, you need to go talk to Connie Earls. We went down and talked to Connie Earls. I've talked to Connie, Mr. Connie Earls two or three times. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, he's never interested in studying the Bible. Now, friends, I, you know, I don't know what to think. I don't know what you think about that. But to me, it seems that if a person, if a man is going to be a preacher and he's going to talk about teaching the Word, he ought to be interested, interested in someone asking questions and let him explain it. Especially someone like Mr. Connor Earls who claims to have the Holy Spirit. So why wouldn't he then be someone who wants to give an answer? I mean, if anybody should give an answer, it ought to be someone who claims to have the Holy Spirit. I mean, they ought to give the best answers, shouldn't they? See, I'm asking a question. I'm trying to get you to critically think. I'm trying to get you to think, well, yeah, they should be willing to talk about it if they have the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's going to guide them in all truth. See how that works? <clears throat> and so what I want to do is I want to talk, let's ask some critical questions about miracles. Let's, let's ask some critical questions about uh, spiritual gifts and miracles and things like that, because that is how we're going to know what the Bible teaches on the subject. Now, to me, this is a subject, it's kind of a timeless subject because people are always asking us questions about it. They're sending us emails, asking us about the Holy Spirit and that sort of thing. So I want to give you, a, give you a chance. Let's do some critical thinking about this matter. So here's a question. Remember, questions are the important tool we're going to use tonight. Now, here's a question. Are we commanded to have miraculous gifts? Are we commanded to have them? Now, that's an important question, I believe. I believe it's a very valid question. Listen to what Mr. Jackie Poe says on the, on the topic of miraculous gifts. All right? Listen to what he says. Just a minute. Why don't you back up the train a little bit? I gave you that body to take care of. I gave you the right kind of food to eat. All you have to do is eat the right stuff. Exercise. Yes, Lord. Amen. Well, I know it's real quiet in here because I hit a sin that we all commit. Receive gifts of the Holy Ghost and impart those gifts to others. There's an impartation that needs to take place. Walk in the... That's what I want you to listen to. Receive miraculous gifts and impart them to others. Others. He says there, there's an impartation that needs to take place. Well, my question is, how does that take place? Does anybody ask how? See... I mean, you know, there ought to be a time when we just turn into Indians, you know. Someone says, well, we need miraculous gifts. How? You know? You, you, need to be, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. How? See, we should start asking people, well, how is that? Instead of just saying, oh, yeah, we, we need to be in party with the Holy Spirit. And no one ever critically thinks. They never stop and go, how is that going to be possible? How does that happen? How can we receive it? Now listen to what Mr. Poe says about the, uh, uh, about the Holy Spirit. This is kind of a montage of things that he said. But they thought that it was all going to be over. But then on the day of Pentecost, the, the disciples, 120 people, got baptized with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And thank God God's still baptized with the Holy Ghost today in these last days. He's still doing... Still baptizing with the Holy Ghost today. How? How? No one ever says that. All right? What he did then. Praise the God. devil cannot stop what God started. God started Pentecost a long time ago, and he's still doing it today. Praise God. He's still pouring his holy power out today. <laughs> For those that want it, there's more to this Holy Ghost power 
than just praying in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. There's more to this than shouting, jumping, and all that. You understand Are that. you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? You got the power. But if you've recently been saved, or if you've been saved for a long time, and you haven't been baptized with the Holy Ghost, you need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Now, hear what's up. You've been saved a long time, and you ain't been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay. How? How? I mean, does that does that not make anybody ask a question? I mean, here's a man going, you need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Oh, okay. What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I do it? No one asks these questions. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, preach it. Preach it, Pastor. Oh, preach it. That was, that was excellent. Yeah, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But he never tells you how, what, when, where, who, where, whatever. And no one ever asks those questions. And if you do ask questions, you know, you're, being, you, you, you're kicked out because now you're a troublemaker. What did he say, Ethel? You need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Here's the sad thing about so many Church of God folks, though. They'll get baptized with the Holy Ghost and when, sit down. When you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, same thing. When you get baptized with the Spirit of God, everybody that gets baptized with the Spirit of God can pray in other tongues. Amen? Everybody can. Everybody can. And everybody ought to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What qualifies you to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? Saved? Saved? I mean, y'all are quiet on that for some reason. That's, that's what qualifies you saved. All right. So what qualifies you to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? Saved. If you're, if you're saved, you've got, you got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And no one ever stops and go, well, why don't I have it? Now, some people will ask that question. There's a few people that have asked that question to me. And it's like, I've I'm, I'm been to Pentecostal church all my life, and, and all these people jumping around, hooping and hollering, and they got the Holy Spirit, but I've never got it. I, I never had these feelings or whatever. Something wrong with me? Well, I don't think anything's wrong with you, my friend. I think there's something wrong with everybody else. So you're asking the right questions. Why is it that the Holy Spirit falls on some of these people, they roll around the floor and convulse on the floor like, like they're having an epileptic seizure or something, and somebody else over here yapping like a dog, jib-jabbing, like a baby, and they're saying that the Holy Spirit, and there's some guy sitting there going, God must not love me because I don't get any of that. See, are we commanded to have miraculous gifts? Look, here's some quick critical questioning here. If miraculous gifts are given of on being saved, then why doesn't everybody have them? I mean, if you, if you, I'm going to use the denominational term here, if you get saved and, the Holy, and you get the Holy Ghost, why is it that some people get saved and don't have it. Don't have the Holy Spirit. Don't have the miraculous gifts. See? And then uh, how does somebody obey that command? See, that's what we're talking about. How, how does someone obey that command? Friends, do you know that in the Bible no one is ever commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Now, Jackie Paul says they are. Oh, you, need, you better get baptized. You need to be baptized. He doesn't tell you how. He doesn't tell you how. And as a matter of fact, he won't tell you in the Bible how they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. He just tells you you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know? That's like someone saying, well, you need a uh, transmogrifier. And you say, oh, yeah, I need one of those transmogrifiers. If I told you you need a transmogrifier, what are you going to ask me? Surely you're going to have some questions about that, right? If you, I'm, I'm going to tell somebody over sitting over here, you need a transmogrifier. You hear me? You're going to say, well, number one, what is that? Number two, why do I need it? Number three, where do I get one? Number four, how much does it cost? Number five, you know, you, you have all kinds of questions that come rolling in. It's like, wait a minute. 
I've got some questions about this. But yet someone comes up and tells you, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they go, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No one ever asks questions. How, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Is it prayer? I mean, Jackie Paul said, yeah, you, you need to be a part of what the Holy Spirit is. Impartation that needs to be need to be done here. You need the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, how, how do I get the Holy Spirit then, Jackie Poe? You didn't tell me that. Do you pray for the Holy Spirit? Do you roll the floor for the Holy Spirit? What, do you beat your head against the wall? What? How do you do it? No one ever says how. Listen, <clears throat> if you want some impart impartation of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, do you get it through prayer? Look what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 14, 13, he says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So here's a man that's speaking in an unknown tongue, and that's just a, that's a language. That's an unstudied, unlearned language. It's a language. It's actual, an actual language, but it's one that he didn't, wasn't raised in. He wasn't taught it. And yet he's speaking to a group of people that don't understand that. So Paul says, Pray that he may interpret. What he needs is he needs the gift of interpretation. Now, how is he going to get it? Is he going to pray for it? Is he going to pray for it? You know what, friends? If prayer was the only condition or the only way that someone would could have a, have a gift, then there wouldn't be any reason to pray for an interpretation. Right? If prayer were the only condition, everyone would have a gift. And there wouldn't be any reason to pray for an interpretation except one time I pray for an interpretation. I'm going to interpret my own tongue. Now, friends, you know, see how silly that is? God knows better than that. God knew that if someone was going to be speaking in an unknown tongue, someone else needed to give the interpretation. That's why, look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 28. Look what he says. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and God. So, the way you get a miraculous gift is not pray for one. Otherwise, this man's speaking in an unknown tongue. He just prays, oh, I'll pray for interpretation. Then he tells the interpretation. See, I'll just be up here, jib, jab, jib, jab, jib, jab, jib, jab. Now, what I said was, and then he gives you interpretation. Jib, jab, jib, jab, jib, jab. God said, y'all need to give me all your money. Oh, okay. Break out the wallet. Pass the chicken bucket. People believe that today. These folks get up here and they jib, jab, jib, jab, jib, jab, and someone else comes along and says, well, you know, the the, the, the Lord just told me, you know, pass the bucket around again because y'all didn't give enough money. Oh, let's fill up the bucket. So that, and so, this is what we're talking about. It doesn't just you don't just get miraculous gifts by by praying for them. If that were the case, then there would an interpreter would always be present. And listen, if if praying would have worked, Paul wouldn't have needed to make a trip to Rome to give them a miraculous gift. Look at this in in Romans one and verse eleven. <coughs> Paul says, I long to see you. He talked to those folks in Rome. He said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established. Now, why did they need to see Paul? Or why did Paul need to see them? See, that's a question. When you're reading along and you're seeing this, you might ask the question. Now, why does Paul need to go to Rome to give them a miraculous gift, a spiritual gift? Why wouldn't they just pray for it? You know, your pastor might have told you, just pray and you'll get the Holy Ghost. But yet here, Paul says to the folks in Rome, I need to see you to, get, to give you a miraculous gift. You shouldn't be asking the question, wait, why did Paul need to go? You know why Paul needed to go? Because Paul needed to go because he was an apostle. And the only way you're going to get a miraculous gift is through the laying on the apostle's hand. But if someone tells you, oh, you just pray for it and you believe that, friends, you're not, you're not thinking. You're not thinking here. See? Look at this. In Acts 19, in verse 5, Paul comes to Ephesus, and he says, Have you received the Holy, Holy Spirit since you've been baptized? 
And they said, we have not so much as heard where the Benny ought to go. And he said, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And Paul said, John, John the baptizer, he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Jesus. Paul's, uh, John's baptism was a preparatory baptism. It was getting people ready for Jesus. You believe on him who's coming after you. So you folks in Ephesus, y'all are living after Jesus. Jesus has already come, lived, died, rose again, gone back to heaven. So what you're doing is no longer valid. He says, you're, you've obeyed a, a, an invalid uh, teaching. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus or by the authority of Christ. And notice this, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and, and all the men were about twelve. How did they receive the Holy Spirit? How did they receive miraculous gifts to prophesy, speak in tongues? Through the laying on the apostles' hands. See, for folks, critical thinking will help you, help you solve a lot of questions about the Holy Spirit today. Instead of just believing someone come along and say, well, this is what... This is what you need to do. If you are critically thinking and asking questions, going, well, wait a minute. Why is that so? How is that so? How can that be the case? If, if you just prayed for a miraculous gift, why is it that Paul had to go to Rome? Why is it Paul had to lay hands on people? Why is it that the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8 <coughs> had been saved, they obeyed the gospel, but yet they didn't get miraculous gifts. Look at this in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. When they were, they were scattered abroad, whenever they were preaching the gospel, Philip wound up in Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. All right? Now what happens? Let's come on down to verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, of Christ, of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, here's a question. Jackie Pole says, well, one of the conditions of receiving the Holy Ghost is being saved. Well, those folks were saved. I don't think anybody could argue that the folks in Acts chapter 8 from Samaria were saved. They believed the gospel. They obeyed the gospel. They'd be baptized. And yet they didn't receive the Holy Spirit until an apostle came. So, Mr. Poe, you need to ask, somebody needs to ask Pastor Poe the question. Uh, if I was to receive a miraculous gift today, how do I do that since there are no apostles? Why is it in Acts chapter 8 they need the apostles to lay hands on them to receive these miraculous gifts? You know why no one asks these critical questions? Because no one's really studying the Bible. They just listen to what the preacher says and they're taking it at face value. You think, well, he's the preacher. I'm gonna he's going to tell me what's right and what's wrong. They don't think at all. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, uh, Brian. All right? So, and again... If it's, a, if it's a critical question or if it's, a, if it's a command, how do you obey that command? How do you obey that command? See? Be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay, can you tell me how? No, can't tell you how. You just need to do it. Silliness. It's because no one's thinking. All right, here's another critical question. Do those who claim to have miracle, miraculous gifts, do they do greater works? Do they do greater works? Now, here's why I'm asking that. Listen to what this Pentecostal preacher said. Well, I think he's going to say it. Maybe he's not going to say it. Maybe he's scared to say it now. I can find it, though. Hang on one second. That is Albert Robertson. And 
this is Greater Works today. Let's do it this way. Jesus Christ, the divine Lord and Savior and Healer who walked the shores of Galilee, who was how uh, Jesus was anointed. Uh, with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all that were pressed of the devil for God was with him and he said these things that I do shall you do in greater just as Jesus ministered that way we have to minister that way praise God for deliverance you cannot deny it's in the book and you cannot deny it is for our day oh you may sit with your mouth but you will perish in your unbelief all right I, I, I couldn't hear that very well. I'm going to play it one more time so I can hear it. Jesus Christ, the divine Lord and Savior and healer that walked the shores of Galilee, who was, how Jesus was anointed uh, with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all that were pressed of the devil. But God was with him, and he said, These things that I do shall you do in greater. Just as Jesus ministered that way, we have to minister that way. Praise God for deliverance. You cannot deny it. it's in the book, and you cannot deny it. it's for our day. Oh, you may sit with your mouth, but you will perish in your unbelief. All right, that's Mr. Albert Robertson. He would hide in the kitchen until we got off the air. <clears throat> but here it is, miraculous gifts for today. You can't deny it. It's in the book. It's in the book. Well, friends, it's in the book, all right. But here's what he's quoting. He's quoting John 14, 12. Verily, 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 I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, here's a question. See, we, we've, got to, we've got to ask some critical questions here to find out what this verse means. Now, the works that Jesus did, there's no doubt about it, they included miracles. All right, that's what he's talking about. No doubt about the works that he did would include miracles. <clears throat> healing the sick, uh, healing the blind, the lame, raising the dead, right? Th those, those, those were great works. But the apostles were the ones Jesus was talking to. And, uh, but they didn't do greater works than raising the dead or healing the sick or, you know, things like that. Not in the sense of something, something above that. I mean, how do you do something greater than raising the dead? I mean, what, what is that? Jesus goes, well, I'll raise the dead and you're going to do something greater than that. I, what's after that? Raising the dead and feeding him supper? I, I mean, what is that? What Jesus didn't mean you're going to do something greater or more powerful than raising the dead. He's simply saying that the, the magnitude of what they're doing is going to be greater. It's going to be farther reaching than what he did. I mean, think about it, friends. Think about it. The things that they did, that the apostles did, they healed the sick, they raised the dead, they brought, they brought people back to life, they healed the lame, and so forth. I mean, all these things. They did what Jesus did. <clears throat> but they were only greater because of the qua quantity, the far-reaching effects. I mean, think about it. The number of things they did. Jesus lived on this earth for three years. All right, he had a three-year ministry. He lived longer than that on earth, but he had a three-year ministry. The apostles uh, had decades of ministry. I mean, you think about the, the greater number of things that the apostles did. They were greater than what Jesus did. And the thing that Jesus did, the Bible says, the world couldn't contain them all. I mean, what, friends, when you pick up the Bible and you read the Acts of the Apostles, and you read the things that Paul did, and you read the things Peter did. Did you ever stop and think that Peter and Paul are only two of the apostles 
These are really not the act. The, this book is not really the acts of the apostles. It's the acts of some of the apostles. And really it's the acts of just a couple of apostles mainly. I mean, Peter and Paul are the two main characters in the book of Acts, if you really want to get right down to it. After Acts chapter 13, you've got kind of Peter up to Acts chapter 13, then you've got Paul through the rest of the book. So if you want to talk about the greater things that were done by the apostles, we just have a, I mean, a drop in the bucket of what they did. Just like we just have a drop in the bucket of what Jesus did. I mean, John said, if the things that Jesus did were written, the, the, the world couldn't contain, contain it. So we're, we're talking about the, the magnitude of the number of things they did are, were going to be far greater than Jesus. And the, and the number of people they converted. I mean, how many people did Jesus convert in his three-year ministry? I, I don't know. I mean, I know there were, I know there were 12 apostles. I know that there were 120 gathered together in one place in Acts chapter 1 that were obviously disciples of Christ. I know that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 he showed himself to above 500 on one occasion. So even if we, even if we have a very uh, 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 liberal and generous number on how many people Jesus converted, let's say, let's say, uh, uh, let's say 1,000, 2,000. Let's say there are 1,000 or 2,000 followers in his three-year ministry, which I don't think there's any way of knowing. But on the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon, 3,000 people obeyed the gospel. You see what I'm saying? That's a greater work in the area of conversion. And then when you talk about just the area that they evangelized, the area they covered, you realize, friends, that Jesus preached the gospel in Palestine. The land of Palestine, <clears throat> all total. Now, if you look at it, if you look at the map, I should have had a map here. But if you look at a map of Palestine, it's from the Mediterranean Sea. The Jordan Valley runs right down the middle. And then you have over. Then you have t on the east side. Uh, you have land over to the uh, like the uh, of, of Arabian Desert and or actually Arabian Desert south, but over to the say the. Uh, there, well, there's a desert there. You have to be the Arabian Desert. That, that's an area about 12,000 square miles. You say, well, how big 12,000 square miles? 12,000 square miles would be about the size of Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts and Connecticut. Actually, that'd be a little bit bigger than what Palestine is. Now, if you look at a map, you find Massachusetts. That's that state that's got the big hook on it up there up in the northeast. And then Connecticut is right underneath it. And you say, man, that is a T90 chunk of land. That's exactly right. T90 is right. And that's the area that Jesus evangelized. That's, that's where his ministry covered. The apostles, the apostles took the gospel into Asia. Palestine, into Asia, into Europe, and even parts of Africa. If you want to count the Ethiopian unit going down in Africa. So you're talking about evangelizing on at least three continents that we know of. Now, is that a greater work than what Jesus did? You see what we're talking about, friends? He's not talking about continuing to do miraculous works. He's talking about them uh, surpassing in magnitude what he did. That's what we're talking about. And yet someone comes along like Albert Robertson and some of these faith healers or miraculous uh uh, fake healers, soothsayers, and con artists tripping up the people, tricking the people, and they're going, <clears throat> oh yeah, we have miraculous gifts. You said we're going to do greater things than these. Did you ever stop and ask the question, how are they greater? You know? Is that politically incorrect to pull out the Indian and go, how? How? How were the things they did greater? I mean, I, just ask that question. Just stop and think about it, friends. How is it that they were going to do things greater than Jesus? People today. I mean, just, let's ask that question. Let's ask that question today. 
Today's advocates that claim you have miraculous gifts, that the Holy Spirit is available today, that there are supernatural gifts, miracles that are available, healing the, healing the sick, uh, he, healing, the, healing the, uh, the sick, raising the dead, speaking in tongues, the gifts of interpretation, discerning a spirit. You know what? I would really like for someone to have the discerning of spirits. I've only known one individual that claimed to have discerning of spirits. Now, friend, you know why no one claims to have discerning of spirits? It's because it's too easy to prove them wrong. You think about that. Someone says, I got discerning of spirits. I, I know what you're thinking. I know what's in your heart. Oh, really? Well, let's just Spill all my secrets in. What's in my heart? They don't have discerning of spirits. Oh, but you say, I've got a miraculous gift. I can speak in tongues. Oh, really? Do something. And they go, and they just jib, jab, jib, jab, jib, jab. jib and they say, that's a tongue. Should have bought a tie, want to bought a tie, should have bought a Honda, whatever it's called. That's, that's all they say, jib, jab. See, it's easy to fake speaking in tongues. But no one questions, well, what do they do that's greater than what Jesus did? What do they do that's greater than the apostles? As a matter of fact, just ask the question, what do they do? I mean, let's think about it. You want to do something that's greater than raising the dead? How about you start with raising the dead? How about start with something that's just as great as raising the dead? No one ever does that. No, no one ever says, oh, my loved one, my loved one was, was killed in a car wreck. Well, let, let's go call the faith healer over there and let's bring them right back to life. No one ever says that. You hear about this baby, wherever that, that baby was, and uh, got eaten by, I guess it's Florida, eaten by an alligator. Why didn't Benny Hinn or somebody truck on down there and say, fear not, the baby just is sleeping. Put it back together. Heal all the scars. Stop the mama from crying. No one ever does that. Why? They can't do it, friends. But no one ever questions them. You know why? Because we haven't been conditioned, we haven't been trained, we haven't been taught to ask critical questions. You see, friends, up here? See, see on, the, on the screen right here? Here's three phone numbers. Three phone numbers. You can call in and ask critical questions of us. But oftentimes what we get, we don't get critical questions, we get name calling. Every once in a while we get a good question. But see, questions are beneficial. Now, what about this? Do you have the power to do miracles? Do you have the power to do miracles? Listen to Let's go back to Jackie Poe here. Well, maybe he's not going to do it. I will get him. They've got that same power to preach Jesus. And when that takes place, when we get all these elders and encouragers out there doing their ministry, Oh, help me, God. Doing the ministry they're called to do. And by the way, and I said this at the very beginning, this family care ministry is of God. If we've ever done anything of God, this family care ministry is of God. Because our purpose is to, is to, is to love you, to take <coughs> care of you, to let you die as lie as lie. That hasn't changed. Folks, it just hasn't changed. God's standard has not changed. People can say, well, we need to throw the Bible away all they want to, and they can say we need to change the Constitution all they want to, but it's not going to change. You can't change God's Word, and, and you can't change the Constitution because it's based on God's Word. 
I won't even talk about the, the, the Constitution comment. Really, you can't change the Constitution? There's a thing called amendments to the Constitution. What, that, what is that? That is changing the Constitution. Hello? The Bill of Rights is changing the Constitution. See what we're talking about, friends? Critically thinking? Oh, he's right. We can't change the Constitution. Whatever. All right. But did you, did you notice the first thing out of the box? Look at this lady right here. They've got that same power to preach Jesus. And when that... What was she doing? She was signing. She was doing sign language to someone. And here he's talking about healing people. And right over there in the assembly is someone who's deaf. Critical questions, folks. Like, why didn't you go heal that person? Why didn't you go heal that deaf person so that lady can turn around and listen? I guarantee you, if you'd heal that deaf person, I'd be listening to you. See, no, no one ever stops and thinks. They just take it at face value. Oh, yeah. Oh, pastor said it. It must be right. It must be true. Heard it on the Internet or something. I don't know. But you know what they do? They claim to have the power. And the Jackie folks claim to have the power. We all have the power, he said. But you know what? Here's, here's what happens. When you say, well, perform a miracle, you know what they usually say? Well, I don't have the power. God has the power. Really, it's God has power. I don't have the power. God just, God just does it. So God performs the miracle through you. Yeah, but see, God does it. I don't have any, I don't have any control on that. Friends, have you ever read the Bible? Uh, critical thinkers, have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever read about someone uh, using the power that was given them? I mean, the apostles were promised the power in Acts chapter 1. They were promised the power. Jesus said, Terry, Jerusalem, until you be endued with power on high. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 2, verse 3, verse 5, verse 8, they were promised the power. And then in Acts chapter 2, they were given the power. A sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared upon them cloven tongues like as a fire, and they began to speak with tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. That was the power. That was the power. Now notice this. In Acts 2, verse 43, look what the Bible says. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by God. No, it's done by the apostles. But everybody knows the apostles got the power from God, but yet the Bible says they were done by the apostles. Don't give me this business about, well, God does it, I don't have any part of it. Don't try to deflect here. You claim to have the power, do something. In Acts, in Acts 14, verse 3, Long time therefore they abode, they, uh, they abode, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hand. We know that God behind the miracles. No man can do these miracles, that thou, these things that thou doest, except God be with him. That's what Nicodemus said in John 3. They knew God was behind it. But men were involved, done by their hands. Now, you want to, you want to say you have the power to do, the Holy, to do miracles? Do it then. Acts 3 and verse 6. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, ride and walk. What did Peter have? He had the ability, he had the power, he had the authority to perform miracles. Now, if you claim that you have them today, do it. But why is it people, can, people let these folks get by with saying things like that and no one ever questions it? You know why? Because no one thinks critically. No one thinks critically. Acts 19, verse, verse 11. Acts 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. We go on and on and on. We're out of time. Friends, here, here's the bottom line. We need to be critical thinkers. If you want to Make sure you don't fall into a snare of a false teacher or false doctrine. You need to question the person that's teaching you. You can question us. I mean, that's why the phone lines are lit up, are, are available. They're not lit up. 
I guess nobody wants to wants to ask a question. But you see what I'm saying, friends? You need to start asking questions about what you're hearing. Don't just take it at face value. Oh yeah, he said he got the power. Well, everybody got the power. I got the power. You need the Holy Spirit. Oh, just get the Holy Spirit. No one asks why, who, what, when, where. No one ever asks any critical questions. How is that even possible today? But here's a question you should ask. If these modern-day miracle workers really have the power that God gave them, then why do they fail? Why are they not able to do what folks who had these same powers did in the Bible? Can't do it. Can't do it. Folks, that's why we're, we're encouraging you. You need to ask questions. You, you can call us. You can ask us a question. We'll be glad to answer your question. Because it's all part of rightly dividing the word of truth. Critical thinking. If it's important in finding a job, you know it's important in making it to heaven. Your soul depends on it, friends. Don't take what you hear at face value. What you need to do is you need to ask someone the questions. Critical thinking. If I, well, I can assist you in any way, here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653, word from the Lord at gmail.com. Till next time, friends, critically ask critical questions. Ask if what they're telling you is really a word from the Lord. Have a good night.